Well, happy April, everyone. Um, happy Easter to those of you who celebrate it. We're going to be doing things just a little differently today. You'll notice that I have not started my video, and I have actually inhibited anyone's ability to start video. So what I'd like you to do for the next 30, 45 minutes is find something blank to look at. It can be a, a blank screen, a blank wall, a blank piece of paper, the back of your hand. We kind of want to take the visual input out of it here. Uh, writing is, is a really cerebral thing, and it's intended to, to create certain outcomes, whether you're trying to entertain someone, make them feel something, whether you're trying to just convey information. And all of that happens in your head, and it's really easy for us to get distracted by, by other things when our brains are getting other input. So I, I kind of wanted to reduce that input by a little bit. So, so sit down, kind of be chill, focus on the audio. And the first thing I want you to do is actually close your eyes, remove as much visual input as possible. And we're going we're gonna to sit for 60 seconds of silence. And if, you're, if you happen to be watching this replay later on YouTube, uh, like do this. Like just sit for 60 seconds and, and let this play. And here's what I want you to do during that 60 seconds. I want you to look inside your head and see what's going on in there. Uh, Short-term things. What do you plan to do later today? What did you do last night? But also kind of look at the long-term things that are bouncing around inside your brain. How do you feel? Like how's, how's life going? What kind of mood are you typically in? Uh, and just really, really get a feel for just everything that's kind of not only going on actively, but everything that's influencing what's going on. So we're going to start right now. And done. Good. So today we're going to talk about storytelling. Storytelling is one of the most fundamental forms of human communication. It's how we figured out, or at least figured out how we thought the world came to be. It's how we passed knowledge on. Um, storytelling predates written communications by hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Writing all forms of writing is storytelling. Now, obviously, if you're writing a fiction book, it's pretty clear how that's storytelling. If you're teaching something to someone, there needs to be storytelling involved for it to work. Uh, the fact that we've used stories for thousands and thousands of years to pass along information tells us that our brains are designed to learn through storytelling. If you're sending an email message or even just a little Slack message, that needs to tell a story. And the word storytelling has gotten co-opted a lot by, by the world of marketing and self-help gurus and everything else. And so it's kind of easy to say, bah, it's just a fad, but, but it actually isn't. People may have glommed onto it recently, but, but storytelling is a very real and important part of how the human brain functions at a very, very, very foundational level. The exercise I just had you do is designed to help you understand your own context. Everything that's going through your mind at any given moment and every emotion that's influencing how you feel about things, that's your context. And it changes from moment to moment and day to day. Uh, you know, you could have one day where I could walk up to you and go, hey, how you doing today? And you might go, you know what, I'm doing pretty good. I could say that exact same thing in the exact same tone of voice the next day. You can go, uh, piss off, because your context has changed. And your context changes how you ingest information. And most importantly, it changes how you emit 
information. When you are writing, when you are telling a story, even if it's in one sentence, you need to try and subtract your context from that. It's incredibly important. Now, again, if you're you know, writing a fiction book, it's kind of easy to see how you know, just because I'm having a bad day doesn't mean my character can have a bad day. Like That doesn't fit the story I'm trying to tell. I need to get into my character's head. That's a really important way to think about all forms of writing, is to get into the head of your character, or more importantly, to get into the head of your protagonist, your hero. When you write a fiction book, you really do have to sink behind the eyes of your protagonist, the, the, the people, the characters who are actually experiencing the story you're telling. You talk about what they see. You talk about what they hear. You're talking about what they're feeling. You're talking about what they're doing and what they anticipate and what they fear and what they look forward to. And all those things are told not from your context, but from the context you've created for those characters. In any kind of writing, you need a hero. And if you're doing a story, it's really easy, again, to see where that hero comes from. But when you're not telling a story, maybe when you're teaching something technical or you're writing a blog post or you're writing an email to someone at work or you're just sending a Slack message to someone at work, you still need to be telling a story and you can't have a story without a hero. And in those cases, the hero, the protagonist of the story, needs to be the person that you are communicating to. Or if it's a group of people, sort of a shared collective group of people that you're communicating to. They become, a, they become the party, right? The, the, the wizard and the elf and the cleric. They become the group of heroes that are in your story. And if you really think about what I just said, when you're communicating to someone else, when you're writing something for someone else, when they are the hero of the story, whose context is most important? It should be their context. Now, you can't get inside someone else's head, and it's important to recognize that. It's important not to make a lot of assumptions about their context because you can't get in their head. You have to tell a story that's meaningful to them, that's powerful to them, that's compelling to them. And sometimes it means doing a little bit of thinking and a little bit of research. It's one of the reasons why these COVID times have been really difficult for people to communicate because when we're not around each other in the office all the time, when we're not sitting next to each other, when we don't hear the, the, the low chatter that kind of goes on in the office all the time, we start to lose even a tenuous contact with those people's context. You know, just we hop in a Zoom meeting, but that's business. There's, there's an agenda. There's things we have to schedule. And maybe there's a little bit of small talk up front, but it's not, it's not like being together, right? When you're together, that's when you hear that so-and-so's puppy is sick or they, they're thinking about getting a new car. And all of those different cues really, really feed into our shared understanding of other people's context. It tells us if they're happy or they're sad. And we, we kind of instinctively understand that, you know, if someone's puppy is sick, now is probably not a great time to go to them with a difficult work thing, right? They've, they've got other stuff on their mind. But if they're happy about something, that might be a great time to strike up a conversation about something important. So, all forms of writing should tell a story, and that means they need to have a hero, and the hero needs to be the person that you are writing to, whether it's a, a single-line Slack message or an entire novel. Now, you can't write a novel unless you know who your audience is. Uh, I'll give you a really good example of that. My uh, editor, the, so I, I mentioned to you guys that my Witch Kind series has uh, been there's an agent who's expressed interest in it, and she wanted to. See, there's some problems with it. Uh, you know, it was one of the earlier novels that I've written, and you learn as you go. And she, she said, you know, there's a lot of potential here, but I, we, we need to, to, to tighten it up. I'd like to put you in touch with an editor. She said because I, I think this has really broad, uh, and high application in the young adult market. The editor comes back, and he says it's a great book. I think we can really, really elevate this, and, and I don't think it'll be hard. He said, but it's not young adult that you are not talking to a young adult reader when you're writing this book. Your, your main character in this book is very solitary and alone. 
and young adults tend to look for stories where they see they see someone that they can they can see themselves as who's not alone. Uh, take the Harry Potter movies uh, and books. The whole point of Harry Potter as a young adult character is that he started off in this very alone place where he was the the only one, and he lived under the, the you know the cupboard under the stairs. And the idea is that young adults identify with that. They, they tend to feel alone, and they tend to feel adrift. And then the story brings them out of that. Harry gets friends, Harry gains superpowers, everything else. Well, my book doesn't do that. And because I am not making a young adult the hero of my story, it's not going to sell well to that audience. And that's fine. There are other audiences. But that's the point. The way you write is going to resonate with a particular audience, and you need to make sure it's the audience you intend it to resonate with. Whoever, you need to look at who am I sending this to? What do I know about their context? How can I make them the hero of this story? Because then they can get invested in the story, they see themselves in the story, and now you've got an opportunity to, to sway their thinking. Once somebody buys into a story and they see themselves in it, they have expressed a willingness to suspend disbelief, meaning they're willing to believe, they're willing to buy into what the story is saying, and they're willing to evaluate it against themselves. And that's an incredibly powerful place to take a person. Um, it, it's, it's how you convince people. It's how you teach people. So I'll give you a, a teaching example of this. Uh, and I'm going to take my, my PowerShell Month of Lunches book, because I know a lot of you on the call right now have, have seen that, but I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to genericize it. So even if you haven't seen that, it won't matter. The problem that a lot of technology people have when they're teaching is that they forget what it was like to learn. What they remember are the things they stumbled over, and so they like to try and front load those things so they can keep their students from stumbling over the exact same things. And that's that's a noble purpose, but it's not a story. Like, think about any story you've read, maybe Lord of the Rings or something like that, right? Nobody showed up right after Gandalf and Hobbiton and told Bilbo, uh, this is an epically bad idea. Like, here's what's going to happen. You're going to go get almost eaten by a dragon. You're going to meet this really weird little proto-Hobbit who lives in a cave. Like, it's going to go bad. Like, dude, just stay where you are. That doesn't happen. In a story, the hero always has to go through the journey. They have to experience the downsides. They have to experience the pain. They have to experience the upsides. Teaching is telling a story. Again, the human brain has been learning things through storytelling for thousands of years. When we see ourselves in a story, there are actual components of our brain. There are neural networks that operate to, to help us learn faster, to build new neural networks. And so you have to tell that story. You have to put your student into the story. You can't, you can't just start with, okay, I'm going to teach you PowerShell. Here's 37 things you need to know about PowerShell before you even start typing. It doesn't work. That's not a story. That's front-loading a whole bunch of concepts that are really abstract and have no connection to the real world. That's, that's literally going into Hobbiton and telling Bilbo, all right, look, here's what's going to happen, and here's what's a bad idea. You can't teach that way. People don't learn that way. Our brains just aren't designed to ingest and create new knowledge that way. So what you have to do instead is construct a learning journey. You have to create a story. Most good teaching stories start with a problem. Hi, welcome to class. Hey, have you ever had to reconfigure 200 servers at the, at the same time? It's a pain in the butt, isn't it? You have to go log into each of them. It's a billion remote desktop passwords. It's, you have to push these eight buttons, every single one of them. Let's see, eight buttons times 200. That's 1,600 buttons that have to be pushed. Like, that's a big deal. I have now taken a student, and I've made them the hero of the story. That's a situation they can relate to. They can see themselves. They've done that. Okay, how do we fix that? Well, here's the first step. And you start walking them through that story. I, I, I know where I need you to be, and I've got a list of the things that I need you to know. And now I need to start, as a teacher, 
deconstructing those and creating a story. Now, what's important in a story, and honestly, stories written for slightly younger readers are a better example of this. And The Hobbit was written for younger readers. Tolkien wrote it specifically as kind of an introduction into the Lord of the Rings universe. And what you'll notice in a lot of those stories is they don't have a lot of tangents. The plot line kind of continues from A to B really, really smoothly. There aren't a ton of subplots, which are another way of saying tangent. There are not a lot of changes in perspective. The, the Hobbit, for example, is told almost entirely from Bilbo Baggins' point of view because that helps create a single story thread, a single narrative to keep track of. Teaching should work the same way. If I know my, my reader is at point A and I want to take them to point B, I need to take them on the straightest line possible with no tangents, with no information that doesn't result in a step toward the destination. Sometimes that means your teaching isn't teaching everything. Sometimes you're glossing over some details. Sometimes you're saying things like, look, don't use right host. Okay, fine. You know what? A student can maybe accept that. I'm not going to get into why just now. Just for now, believe me, because getting into why is kind of this huge tangent, and it's not going to take us closer to the destination. After we get to the destination, if you want to circle back and talk about it, we can. But for right now, I want to stay on this the straight and narrow path. You want to make that path smooth. And in writing fiction, this means using language that is conducive to reading. Uh, it's knowing your audience, right? If you're writing for seventh graders, you're not going to use college-level vocabulary. If you're writing for college level, you're not going to use Dick and Jane style vocabulary that a three-year-old might enjoy. Know your audience. Write for your audience. Guide them through the journey. Make them the hero. You have to take everything about your own context. Oh, gosh, I just really want them to know this thing because it's so cool. You can't. It's not about you. It's not about your context. It's about the learner. It's about the reader. It's about the person experiencing experiencing this journey, not you, who's perhaps already experienced it. The Month of Lunches book is another good example there. It kills me that that book doesn't go into scripting. Because I think ultimately to get someone to be successful in PowerShell, you're going to be writing scripts. But I had made a promise to the learner. I had said, I'm going to tell you a story that will only require about 24 hours of your time spread out across weekdays for about an hour a day for about a month. And I can't get you from point A to point C. I can only get you to point B. And so there's going to have to be another book later. And I had to stick to that commitment. As excited as I was to get people into scripting, that was my excitement, not theirs. Their excitement was just learning a little bit about this new technology and being able to achieve some outcomes. I had to tell their story in my book, not my story. And I do, if you go back and read that book with an eye toward the structure instead of what it's teaching, every single chapter tends to start off with a problem, and then it walks you through a solution. Sometimes it has you hit a hiccup along the way, because that's the journey. That's how we learn is by experiencing those things. And so I'm guiding you through those experiences to make that a little faster for you so that you're not just kind of wandering around on your own. But I'm telling you that story. And at the end of the chapter, we often have a nice outcome. We have a win, just like you might in a, a fiction book, but I kind of leave it hanging with a little bit of a problem. And the next chapter calls that out. It says, you know, that was great, but... And, and the, the, the scripting PowerShell month of lunches is really structured that way. And I take you from writing just a basic command and a text file all the way up to a completed advanced function. And most people who read that book don't even realize what they've done until they get to the end and they're like, oh, crap, because it's a smooth story. It takes them one step at a time. It doesn't try to, to just lay out a bunch of facts. Good stories don't lay out a bunch of facts, right? When the ancient Greeks were telling each other stories about how the world was created 
and how the titans came and how the, the gods battled them. Nobody sat down and said, you know, there's a lot of plot holes here. There's a lot of inconsistencies. They told the story to get the point of the story across. The inconsistencies and plot holes, it's a story. You let those go. Our brains can deal with that. I don't know if any of you have watched the Justice League movie, the, the pre-Zack Snyder cut, but our brains are really good at letting plot holes go. And that's pretty clear. So you, you really don't have to teach everything. You don't have to communicate all the things. You have to tell a story that's designed to get you from point A to point B. In an earlier workshop session, we talked about outlining. This is why outlining is so important. You start by writing down, here's where my reader is. Then you write down, here's where I want them to go. And that's all you focus on in your outline. And that outline keeps you from going off course because every new thing you put in the outline, you have to ask yourself, how is this helping me take a step toward point B? Well, you know, maybe it's not, but then, then there's no other justification. Take it out because that outline is your story. And, and then you go through that outline and you think to yourself, am I telling my story or am I telling someone else's story? Is this how people experience this in the real world? Because that's the story I need to tell. I need to make them the hero, and I need to forget all of my assumptions. I need to do everything I can to tell a story that's going to work for them. Analogies are one of the most powerful things we can use to teach things to other humans. An analogy is a story. If I'm trying to explain object-oriented programming to you, my go-to, as it is with many technology subjects, is a car analogy. An object is like a car. A car can do things, and you can make it do things. You can make it go faster. You can make it go slower. Those are methods. We use methods to tell the object what to do. A car has properties. It has a color, has a make, manufacturer, it has a type of engine. Objects have properties that describe it, and you can look at those properties. Sometimes you can change a property, and that'll change the object. It'd be, be really cool if we could change the, the color property of our car whenever we wanted to and have the paint automatically match, but it's not a software object. It's a real object, and real objects aren't as much fun. That's a story. It's not really about technology. It's, it's, about, it's about telling a little bit of a story. Most of my readers, most of my students know what cars are. They're around them all the time. It's very familiar. And so I'm putting them into the story. I'm picking a piece of their world that's applicable here. Um, I am not particularly a car person. I don't really care for cars. I like Jeeps. I'm okay with trucks. Cars kind of leave me cold. But tons of people like cars, and at the very least, they understand them. And so their story can include that analogy. Not every audience is going to work with that. Someone from a different culture, a different country, where cars are, you know, individual car ownership just isn't as common, might not resonate with them. Cars might feel like, yeah, I mean, it's a thing. I know what a car is, but it's not really part of my story. And you have to be aware of that. I have to know who I'm talking to. Um, the times I've gone to Asian countries, for example, to teach classes have involved a redonkulous amount of research because I had to come up with analogies that would be a part of their story, and they're not part of mine because our cultures are so different. So this idea of storytelling, of starting at point A in the adventure and knowing where point B, the end, is, and telling a story that walks you through that on a smooth and level path, using an outline to make sure that's what you're doing. Make sure you're not going off on a tangent. Make sure you're closing all of your story threads by the end. Making sure that everything you do contributes to that outcome. And making sure that everything between point A and point B doesn't come from your context, but it comes from the context of the reader. So it's meaningful to them. All of those things are incredibly powerful because they tap into the basic structure of the human brain. Uh, humans are unique in the world in that we're the only living beings we know of who can choose to accept something as fact with absolutely zero evidence whatsoever. Now look, your dog, if you have a dog, your dog might 
believe that you're going to feed him at 8 o'clock every day. But if so, that's because you've done it over and over and over and over and over. And so the dog has kind of a body of evidence that this is when feeding occurs. Humans, on the other hand, can create conspiracy theories. We can create ancient gods. We can create religions. We can create all of these things to, to explain to ourselves whatever we want to explain, and they don't have to be connected to the real world at all. Our brains are designed to consume stories. That's one of the reasons that conspiracy theories are so compelling to people, because they're a strong story. They fit the listener's context, meaning they feed into the listener's worldview. And, and that reinforces that worldview, because that's what storytelling does, is it shapes how we view the world. And when you tell a strong, powerful story, and it, it sits within your, your listener's context or your reader's context, and, and what you're doing is really, really attaching to what they care about, and you made them the hero of that story, look around you and you can see how powerful that is. Our brains, for better or for worse, are just designed to do that, and we, we latch on to things like that. So as a writer of fiction, you can create a compelling world that your reader can relate to, that they see themselves in. Um, you know, there's, there's a storytelling technique called the everyman, and the idea there is to have a character who represents your reader. And a lot of times it can be the protagonist, the main character. If you can create a main character that your intended audience can relate to, that's awesome, because they're going to see themselves as that hero, and they're going to experience that hero's ups and downs and highs and lows. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes um, you'll, you'll toss another character in who's maybe from a different time or a different place who doesn't know what's going on in the story. And that forces the other characters to explain what's going on in the story. And in doing so, they're explaining it to the reader. And so that character, that everyman, represents your reader. It puts them into the story. That's what you have to do because our brains are so designed to experience things through storytelling. Okay, so that was, that was a solid half hour of talking. Um, I want to give folks a chance to unmute and ask some questions. So you mentioned with... Um you know, putting in the, the reader's context first, what are some exercises that help you to do that? I've definitely struggled um, in, in doing that myself, trying to take myself out of it. And I guess to be more specific, like how do you think about the start and the end? Like what are some questions that you ask yourself or like how do you get in that frame of mind? If it's for fiction, um, it's pretty easy because you get to make that up out of whole cloth. If it's not, if it's for, for something technical that you want to teach, I look at what is a reasonable endpoint that I could get someone to in a reasonable amount of time. So reasonable being what is a real world outcome that they could accomplish that they weren't able to accomplish for that would be meaningful, that would feel like success, that would feel like a win. And it can't be, okay, you give me 12 months of your time and I'll get it done. It's got to be shorter than that. Um, one of the reasons so few people make it through college has a lot more to do with attention span and the lack of a concrete outcome than it does almost anything else. So, you know, that's why the month of lunches was that. It's 24 hours of effort. If you can, if you can give me one lunch every weekday for one month, and that's, that's a short-term enough out goal, like milestone, that people can be like, okay, I can try and commit to that. So, those are the two things you have to weigh when determining point B. In determining their, the, the context, how to, how to make your reader the hero, you look around. I spent a ton of time looking at different PowerShell Q&A forums to see what people were struggling with, to see what concepts they obviously weren't able to pick up easily. That's where teaching exists. When you're not able to learn something on your own, I have to teach you. We don't technically have to teach small children not to touch the hot pot on the stove. They're totally going to figure that out on their own at some point. We teach them because we want to try and mitigate the damage that that experience could have. 
So teaching is really about holding people back from having a, a, a disastrous experience and helping guide them through the bits of the story that aren't obvious, that they never would have figured out on their own. So I look around. I see what people are struggling with. I, I, I look to see what other explanations are being offered and where those are falling flat. And I, I construct a story, uh, and it can take a lot of time. Like in, in the scripting pool-making book that Jeff and I did, the sequence of events we run you through took us damn near six months just to come up with because we knew we needed to teach all these different things and we needed to make them part of a story. And so we had to craft a story that made room for all of those things and it made room for them in a sensible way. And we had to sequence them so that it, it fit into a nice straight storyline. Well, it's a lot of work crafting a story. Um, George R. R. Martin can probably tell you just how hard it is, especially when you don't know where you're going. So I, I look around, I look at the world, I look for evidence of other people, other people's context. That's really helpful. I just finished the the outlining uh, workshop, and that, that was tremendously helpful for me because my writing process currently is like I have an idea and I start writing. And I usually run out of gas like 25% through because I don't have any anchors. And so that starting the end is, was a huge um, insight for me. Yeah, there's actually a, a formalized instructional design technique you can look into called backwards design. And when I first learned about it, I, I couldn't understand why it was called backwards design because to do it any other way seemed backwards to me. But what it says is you start with a list of terminal objectives job tasks, observable job tasks that you want to teach someone, and then you work your way backwards from there. So you start at the end and you work your way backwards. So in this context, it'd be, you know, kind of clearly defining the end state, assuming, you know, the length of the thing that you want to write, maybe it's a book or it's just maybe a blog post. So you have, you know, the words that you have, the runway you have essentially, and then you define yep. the problem, the endpoint, and then you work back by being curious and looking around and seeing where other people fail to solve that problem and what related problems they have as you start to, to look into that. That's, that's super helpful. Yep. And then you construct a story around that. It's, it's one of the reasons why, you know, at Pluralsight, we, we coach our authors, our video course authors so much to have a sample scenario, come up with a fake company, come up with a fake business scenario that incorporates the problems you're, you're trying to solve and teach it through that lens because then it becomes a story. People can see the connection to the real world. It's not, it's not abstract. It's concrete. It's real. It's relatable. It's meaningful. Uh, it's why I hate hello world examples. Like nobody does that for real. It doesn't mean anything to me. It doesn't feel like an accomplishment to me. I want to feel like I accomplished something and that I can now do something new. Uh, and that's really what teaching is all about. And that's, that's why having that story element helps. The story adds constraint. You know, hey, uh, our sample company here is a coffee company. So oh, fantastic. I know they're probably not going to be flying airplanes then. Like there's all sorts of things now that just are resolved in my mind. And, and I, have a, I have a solid feeling of, of what I'm going to experience in this story. Who else? Any other questions, Zach? Yeah. How do you kind of, you're talking about analogies and, you know, making sure you're kind of being relevant to the, to the reader. How do you come up with different analogies for them? It's, um, it's a creative, it's a creative bit. It, it is literally writing a piece of fiction, right? because no analogy is 100% accurate, right? The analogy is there to explain a particular concept or point, and any analogy, if you pursue it too far, falls apart, and, and they're not intended to represent a completely accurate parallel world. They're intended to just explain something. And so sure. you, you kind of have to keep them concise. You have to you look for similarities. I mean, that's really what an analogy is, is it's playing off similarities. So if you, if you start to look at, at, at let's, say, let's say, TCPIT networking, 
Um, in TCPIP networking, when a computer goes to send a packet, it has to know, am I just going to broadcast this to the local net, or am I going to send this off to my default gateway? Okay, there are some decisions being made. How does it make those decisions? Well, it looks at the subnet mask. Okay, so that's a little bit like, like maybe if I live on the same street as where a letter is going to versus if I live in a different zip code. So I can look at the zip code. The zip code is like a subnet mask. Okay, I'm starting to build an analogy here. If I'm going to deliver a letter to someone in my own zip code, I might as well just run it down the road myself. Otherwise, I'm going to have to wait three days. I could get it there in 20 minutes. But if I'm sending it to another zip code, I'm going to put it in my default gateway, which is a mailbox, and then they're going to go do something with it. Right? So you, you look for similarities where things seem to connect and, and build your story out of that. That's great. Thanks. Who else? In technical writing, do you feel like you're doing storytelling there also? Yeah. Um, if you go and look at some of the, the, the technical writing that you have learned best from, you will find there's a storyline. Uh, you, the person doing whatever, are the hero. There are, there are other characters, you know, perhaps artificial companies or or another administrator or a user or something else, they're, they're telling you a story. There's characters, uh, you know, there might be a villain, you know, the hacker who's trying to get in, right? It, it, we use these storytelling elements versus go to something that was, you know, written in a very academic technical writing style where it's, it's simply quoting facts at you and giving you steps to follow. You will find yourself having to return to those steps because you're not actually learning them. You're just you're repeating them. Um, storytelling is, is one of the best ways for your brain to build new neural networks. And in our, our final workshop next week, we're going to talk about the physical process by which the brain learns and how it learns to enjoy things and how that enjoyment is a positive feedback loop on learning itself. And, and storytelling is a big part of how that works. And, and honestly, we don't know why. We know that it's true because we've got about 200 years of clinical research to back it up, but we don't know why the brain works that way. We don't know why the human brain works that way. We don't know why other animals' brains don't. I mean, the lack of communication is obviously a, you know, a key thing there with other, other brains, but why is it that, that we adopted that? No idea. We just know that it works really, really well. Josh, you're unmuted. Did you want to jump in? I was going to add to that where, so like for the story perspective that I found useful, the technical writing is, is really to stick to that problem solution and just to tell it in a way that isn't fat, like here's a problem, here's a solution. You know, like there's usually some context in there that's going to be the story or, you know, like the meat of the story that you'll be able to tell. And it's, it's typically, it starts with the frustration, you know, like what is the solution um, going to, like how is it going to solve the frustration that you have? And so there's that problem solution that you can create some tension with um, in the story, even though it's purely technical, you know, it's, it's more in um, the story is the, is solving the problem like in and of itself. And so if you keep it in that context, you don't have to have like some kind of external dialogue to support it. It really is just the journey is the story a lot of times and from taking you from problem to solution. Yeah, the, the reason the human brain seeks out solutions is because it experiences negative emotions, frustration, loss, anger, all of those things. And so you start by expressing, by telling a little story about, it's not just, hello, have you ever had to administer 200 servers? Isn't that difficult? No, you've got you've to generate some emotion there. You've got to talk about the frustration and why it's frustrating so that your reader can see themselves and experience that and remember that frustration because that's what's priming their brain to look for a solution. And then at the end of that learning journey, they need to experience that, that endorphin rush of success. They need to have that emotion of, oh, I solved it. I mean, that's why like puzzles and, and all these other things are so addictive to humans is because when we succeed at something, when we learn something and we accomplish it, our, our brain has a feedback mechanism 
that makes that feel good. And we want to feel good. The brain loves to feel good. And so it seeks out those things. And so when you put things into that kind of context, you're triggering all these natural behaviors in our brain that are designed to help us learn in the real world and to survive. And, and we're, we're hijacking those a little bit for our purposes. Um, but that's why the storytelling is important. You can't simply state it as facts because our brain isn't fact-based. Our, our, our brain, like, we like to make analogies about how the brain is like a computer, and the brain is nothing like a computer at all. It's a big, wet, squishy mess of, of juice and flesh, and it behaves the way it behaves, and it likes to feel good, and it doesn't like to feel bad. And you have to hijack that. You have to feed into those emotional loops in order to create a really meaningful learning experience. That's one thing that I uh, hijacked as best I could when I wrote my first book from the month of lunches. And it's, it was really well stated by a course I watched from Malcolm Gladwell saying like, um, you know, leave, leave the puzzle unsolved. And so like, that's how I was able to like, I tried to chain interest in between chapters was there was problem solution at the end, you did solve something, but it just revealed the next problem. Uh, and that's yep. what the month of lunches did continually. Uh, yeah, like, that's, that's actually part of the, the style guide for month of lunches. Um, all the books are supposed to do that. Well, they do it really well. All right, so look, we've you, got about five minutes. So, um, Zach, go ahead. We'll, we'll take just a couple more questions. Yeah, so when you're you know doing a blog and you, you kind of have a story in a blog post, do you kind of continue that story? You know, if it's a series, do you continue that story? Or do you, you know, if it's just a bunch of ad hoc type of posts, you know, how do you, what's your kind of the, some strategies in, in telling a story in a blog? Yeah, so, I mean, a series of blog posts is nothing more than, than several chapters in a book. And so, yeah, I, I do continue the story. You can actually find a series of blog posts on my blog uh, that have done that. Um, I will often start each post with a quick one paragraph recap of where we've been with maybe a link to the previous one in case someone is, is finding this out of order. Um, quick little recap, and then I'll, I'll dive into the story. Um, sometimes at the end, so one of the most powerful human behaviors is collecting. We love to collect things. We love to get to that finish line. We love to know that we got it all. That's why serialized fiction has been so, so popular over the years maybe less so now, and that has a lot more to do with the business models around it than its effectiveness. But you know, if you go back and look at like the old black and white Buck Rogers, always end in a cliffhanger, always leave them wanting a little more. And so I'll do that with a blog post. I'll call the cliffhanger out. I'm like, all right, we just accomplished that. And that was great. Oh, uh, but what if we also needed to do this? See you next time. Because now you've created, again, that emotional craving to cross the finish line and get there, and, and you've, you've sparked a little bit of interest. Uh, and so a lot of people will, in fact, line up and come right back for the next one. Um, so, yeah, that, it's, it's a very powerful technique. Really, the chapters in a month of lunches book are a, a series of blog posts that do exactly that. They're not very long. They're, they're only about 10, 11 pages each. I mean, that's a long blog post maybe, but... For, for a, a technology book chapter, it's quite short. I'd argue with the publisher quite a bit about it. Um, and it, each one tries to set up the next chapter by leaving you with a little bit of a cliffhanger. That's great. All right, cool. So we're right up against end of time. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining me on this lovely Saturday morning. Uh, I will have this up on YouTube uh, probably later in the week, this coming week. Remember, next Saturday is our last session, and that's where we're going to talk about some of this, this pop cognitive science stuff, how the brain actually learns, what it enjoys, what it is that the human brain um, aims for when you're writing fiction, what it is that it aims for when you're, you're writing something to teach. They're remarkably similar because we've only got the one brain, and so that one brain does everything. Um, so show up for that. That'll be the end of it. Um, bring any last Q&A, and uh, we'll wrap it from there. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you.